السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين I would like to welcome you all for our SSPD webinar today I am Dr. Manal Al-Malik I'm a board member of the society and a consultant pediatric dentist at King Fahd Armed Forces Hospital in Jeddah uh, today's webinar is organized by the uh, Saudi Pediatric uh, Society and uh, with Kunuz Ritaj Company. Uh, please note that all participants will be uh, receiving certificate of attendance of tonight's uh, webinar uh, by email uh, in uh, one to two weeks. And uh, it's really a pleasure today to moderate this session with one of my colleagues, Dr. Ali Zahrani. Uh, I will be moderating the first presentation, and Dr. Ali will uh, uh, moderate the second presentation. Uh, Dr. Ali uh, is a consultant uh, in pediatric dentistry uh, at the Security Forces Hospital in Mecca, and he's a director of academic affairs and training at the Security Force Hospital. And he's also a member of the Western Region Committee of the Saudi Board in Pediatric Dentistry. Uh, please note that at the end of each presentation, there will be uh, time uh, to answer some of your questions. And you can use the uh, section of Q&A uh, to write uh, questions that you have. Um, OK, we go to our speaker. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Dr. Anas uh, Al-Sami. Uh, Dr. Anas is uh, a consultant pediatric and special needs dental surgeon at postgrad dental school uh, at Mohammed bin Rashid University of Medicine and Health Science uh, and Dubai Dental Hospital in Dubai. Uh, he's a PhD candidate at Queen's University Belfast, uh, North, Northern Ireland, UK. And he obtained his master's degrees in 2017. He's also a member of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh and Ireland. He has uh, published more than 20 scientific papers in international journals and published two thesis books. He's also a member of uh, uh, committee the IADR. Oh, please, Dr. Anas, you can start to uh, share your screen, please. Assalamu alaikum. Can you hear me now? Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Aminal and Dr. Ali and uh, Dr. Ahmed uh, uh, for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to be with uh, my colleagues in Saudi Arabia. Uh, so today we'll be talking about uh, uh, the... Uh, yeah, so our today topic is about the uh, pediatric dentist evolving role in the managing the cleft lip and palate. And we know that the cleft lip and palate is quite uh, common. Uh, we do see in our hospitals and uh, dealing with these children it's uh, really like it's, uh, challenging and it's required the uh, interdisciplinary approach. So uh, pediatric dentist role is one of the key roles in the management of the any, ch any child with killer flip and palate. So uh, we'll be going through that uh, today. So in general, if you look at the incidence of the cliff uh, lip and palate worldwide, it really varies. Uh, and but uh, when you come to that, uh, I mean, the variation is uh, usually it's, uh, it comes with the race. So in general, the cleft lip and palate incidence worldwide, it's uh, 1.3 per 1,000 birth. And uh, the, as per the race, it also varies. Uh, in Japan, it's 20 per 10,000. And in Western Europe, also we have 12 uh, per 10,000. And uh, in US, it's also very similar uh, to Western Europe. And in the Africa, it's three uh, per 10,000. And when it comes to the uh, uh, type of the cleft, the isolated cleft lip only, it's uh, the incidence is around three 
to four, uh, to four uh, per each 10,000 birds. And the cliff leap and pallet, so it shows, has been shown that the incidence of the having a cliff leap and pallet is uh, more common and the incidence is higher, which is almost double of the incidence of having a isolated lift alone. Uh, well, when it comes to also the gender differences, uh, uh, the uh, cliff leap and pallet, when the pallet uh, and leap uh, both are involved, uh, in the uh, uh, cliff area. Usually the males are the predominant, they are, they are this more common in the uh, males. Uh, but when, it when it's only the cliff palate only without cliff uh, lip, uh, usually it's uh, involved in the females. Uh, so females, since they are more concerned about their aesthetic and appearance, they are lucky that if they, if, God forbid, if they get a cliff lip and palate, they are more common well, most, com most probably they will be having, getting a cleft palate only and without involving the lip. So in the UK also, the according to the type of the, uh, uh, the cleft lip and palate, uh, they found that the most common uh, cleft type is the unilateral cleft lip and palate is the most common followed by cleft palate. And the rest are usually around 10% compromise of the 10% uh, of the, uh, the total uh, prevalence. And uh, in Saudi Arabia, also there was a systematic review by Sabab et al. If we talk about the prevalence and instance of the uh, caliphate palate in our region, uh, so in Saudi Arabia, there were uh, actually they were in included um, uh, eight studies in the systematic review. Three were uh, in the Saudi Arabia, in uh, Riyadh, and and uh, and two were in, in the two. Uh, regions of the uh, Saudi Arabia, which are in Riyadh and Al Qasim. Uh, the other five studies were in the from the UAE and Oman and Jordan. Uh, so the prevalence uh, that was reported in this study, it was from 0 0.3 up to 2.4 uh, per 1,000 live birth. Uh, so which is very similar to the worldwide prevalence that we have. Uh, and the birth pre uh, the uh, prevalence of the orofacial cleft uh, in males was uh, higher than the females, uh, and the isolated cleft uh, was also higher in females here, uh, and in most of the studies reported in our region. So, uh, which pregnancy or which uh, infants are, are more uh, at the high? They are at a high risk of developing cleft lip and palate. So uh, most of, I mean, the, the, going back to the etiology of the cliff lip and palate, there are many reasons, or it can be genetic, it can be environmental, or it can be isolated uh, uh, pattern. But, uh, but the risks that, the, the risk that are already reported in the literature uh, are usually if they have the consigenous unions or the marriage. And smoker mothers, they are at high risk, uh, diabetes or specific Fully gestational diabetes or uncontrolled diabetes, uh, they found that uh, they have uh, higher uh, chances. And um, also, they found that when you go come when the uh, gestational diabetes is also, it's very common. Uh, almost 20% of the in the UAE pregnancies, uh, they uh, the the uh, during the maternity they have uh, uh, gestational diabetes. And uh, one of the complications of gestational diabetes or our uh, negative outcome is microsomia when the child. Uh, ber child uh, birth weight is more than uh, uh, four cages. And they found that uh, in these children also with microsomia, when they, uh, uh, when they, uh, when they are born, they are at higher uh, risk of the, having a cleft lip and palate. And uh, also uh, those mothers who are using uh, medications uh, like um, anticonvulsants, also it has been shown that's uh, one of the risk factors and the increase the matern uh, maternal age uh, and deficiency of certain vitamins and specifically the folic acid deficiency. Uh, it's very important. And uh, as a prevention, using a folic acid before three months before pregnancy, it has been proven to be uh, really preventive in developing califlip and palate in their offspring children. So uh, if you go back to the uh, etiology or embryology of the cleft lip and we know that the lip uh, it's uh, it's formed from the uh, frontal uh, frontal nasal processes and maxillary when they fuse so uh, any uh, uh, disruption in their fusion or failure of the fusion the median nasal of na median nasal and frontal nasal processes with the maxillary uh, it, uh, it leads to the cleft lip and uh, cleft lip if 
it can involve the alveolus or the premaxilla plus minus and that's depend on the uh, the uh, if it is complete uh, cleft or uh, in the uh, complete failure of the fusion or it's partial if it is complete then definitely will involve the primary palate as well so um, again the cleft palate uh, if you go, we go back to our um, biology uh, courses uh, during undergrad if you can see here uh, the, 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 that's a tongue when the, it's between the two shelves of the, uh, of the palatal shelves uh, of the maxillary process and by the time the tongue goes down and the uh, palatal shelves fuses. So any interruptions uh, within in this fusion will lead to the uh, cleft uh, palate. So can we diagnose the, the uh, cleft lip and palate at the prenatal stages? The answer is yes, uh, and now in most of the cases, it's very, it's common, it's, um, uh, I mean, uh, common that uh, to be diagnosed early before, uh, before the birth, uh, during the uh, prenatal stages, uh, by having the uh, two-dimensional uh, two and the three-dimensional uh, ultrasound, uh, it's very easy now to detect uh, the, the accuracy of the 3D uh, ultrasound is 100% uh, in detection. And if you are using the 2D, the conventional uh, ultrasound, the chance is up to 75% detection rate. Uh, so which type of the cleft can be detected? Uh, the cleft lip uh, uh, palate, uh, uh, the cleft is involved the cleft lip and, pa and alveolus, it's much easier. But if it is only cleft palate uh, without involvement of the lip and alveolus, uh, with two dimension and it's not easy to be, to be uh, diagnosed. So uh, uh, the classification of the cliff lip and palates, there are main classifications and you can classify it according to uh, different categories. Uh, so uh, you can have it classified according to the type, which is you can have either cleft lip, it can be cleft palate, or it can be cleft lip and palate. Uh, and according to the location, if you have in the primary in the primary uh, palate or uh, secondary palate, uh, the primary palate, which usually it's uh, uh, also involved the, in the cleft lip and alveolus, and uh, but uh, and uh, usually if it is lip plus minus alveolus, it can be, as we said, depend on the, uh, if it is complete failure of the fusion or partial failure. And the cleft location in the secondary palate, it can be hard palate, uh, soft palate, or it can be only in the uvula. So also according to the, uh, uh, the uh, laterality, also you can uh, classify it as it can be unilateral, bilateral, or midline cleft. Or according to severity, uh, uh, the classification also involves the if it, either it is a complete cleft or an incomplete cleft. The other type, uh, which is uh, in many cases, it's uh, uh, stayed undiagnosed, and it's very hard to uh, diagnose that prenatal with the ultrasound is the subcutaneous cleft, uh, which it's uh, uh, the defect is under the. Uh, the mucous membrane covering the soft palate and it can be a uh, part of it or it can be the whole area under the soft palate. And uh, since it is covered by the, uh, the mucosa of the palates or the, the usually the diagnosis is uh, in cases that you have uh, bifid uvula, that's an indicator. So uh, when you also, uh, uh, if you found the, that's a clinically visible sign that you can see a bifid uvula. But if you found that, then you have to palpate to find a knot in a hard palate, or uh, it's in very rare cases, that's very really hard to diagnose if you had to find a blue or white mid palatal line uh, the, here. But it's very really hard to find it, uh, in, especially in children. Uh, but uh, the most, I mean, the most uh, uh, diagnostic sign uh, to lead you to do further investigation is when you have a bifid uh, In these cases, usually the problems which are associated is during the feeding, and it also affects their speech and the ear because of the recurrent ear infection sometimes. So uh, the cleft lip and palate, it has uh, the, the, according to the phenotype, uh, you can see uh, incomplete lip, lip, or you can have lip and li uh, with alveolus, and you can have unilateral. Uh, uh, cliff lip and palate, and you have bilateral here, cliff lip and palate, 
and here is the, uh, in, the incomplete uh, uh, cleft palate, uh, that's a complete cleft palate. And here what you can see, uh, it's the, uh, actually it's, uh, uh, these are the labial pit, but uh, here there is a uh, cleft lip which was uh, repaired. And usually these pits, you see them in the Van der Waals syndrome, uh, that's a diagnostic feature of the Van der Waals when you can see the labial pit in there. Uh, uh, the, labia, the middle part of the uh, upper and lower lips. So uh, that's one example of the unilateral cleft uh, lip and palate. Uh, it involved the lip and the alveolar bridge and the palate, but in one area, the right and left, but it's more commonly uh, to be se uh, seen on the left side. And it's more common in males and uh, less likely it is associated with the uh, syndrome, but if the syndrome associated usually it's the Van der Waals syndrome. That's a, one of the most severe uh, classification of the cleft lip and palate. Uh, you can see here that we have, there is a bilateral, uh, complete cleft lip and palate. That's one of the most severe classification and hardest to uh, treat uh, and do the surgery and with the uh, less prognosis and more complications to the child. Uh, maxilla here is, you can see that separate into three parts uh, with the pre-maxilla. Uh, area which is protruded, uh, and uh, that's a bilateral. Also, with an exa another example of the bi bilateral cleft lip and palate. Here you can see the uh, severe maxillary constriction. It's almost a V-shaped palate, and they have here the increase also the uh, palatal prognathus that you can see. It's uh, aesthetically usually the, the children it affect the children uh, uh, and psychologically because it's not. Uh, they get bullied and uh, teased at the school, and most of them they avoid going to the school, uh, unfortunately. And you can see the, here that there is severe extrusion of the premaxillary segment. And uh, uh, in most of the cases, to treat this area, they need osteotomy of the premaxilla. So that's an isolated, incomplete cleft uh, palate, which involved the palate only, but an incomplete to start from the soft palate. And you will lie, it's more associated with the syndrome visually with the stickler syndrome. And it's more common in females, as we said initially, the cleft palate only, it's more common in the females and cleft lip and palate it's more common in males. And uh, as we said, the, if it's not, the, the more posterior the cleft it is, the harder to be diagnosed in prenatal diagnosis. That's a complete cleft palate. Uh, it's uh, less common than cleft lip and palate, and uh, again, it's more common in females, and again, it's more as mostly associated with stickler uh, syndrome, and uh, the diagnosis is also difficult in, uh, if it is involving the palate only. So those are the types of the cleft lip and palate. So if you think now how we are going to manage them, uh, and who is it usually to have uh, uh, the, to uh, put a treatment plan and do the, the, the management of the child. Management of the child is start before the birth, uh, during the prenatal. Uh, once it is diagnosed that, uh, with the ultrasound, the management actually starts at that stage and it might continue up in 20, the 20s and 30s. So it's, uh, the management really takes a very long time, the, uh, almost uh, two, three decades of the life of, it, of, it, uh, of any individual diagnosed with cleft lip and palate. So uh, uh, to manage this uh, uh, individual with cleft lip and palate, you really need to have a team comprised of pediatrician, genetics, nursing, or maxillofacial surgeon. Uh, uh, ENT, plastic surgery, psychology is very important, social work, and speech and language pathology, does, uh, these are the uh, very important uh, uh, specialties that should be involved. And from the dental, other than the ormaxillofacial surgeon, orthodontics and pediatric uh, dentistry, they are the one of the most important uh, in the team members in this craniofacial team. Uh, to help the because as you know the cleft lip and palate it's affect the oral maxillofacial oral and facial area uh, so definitely uh, having a pediatric dentist who can take care of these children from the early stage of their life is very important so um, 
Uh, the most common dental problems usually associated with cleft lip and palate, and uh, if you don't see all of them, but most probably you will see most of them, uh, one of them is the neonatal teeth, and that's more common to have at the uh, cleft area. Ectopic eruption is very common, especially for the ectopic eruption of the canine, the uh, lateral on the cleft side, if it's not missed, the centrals, primary centrals, usually most of them they get ectopic eruption, and ectopic eruption of the uh, first <coughs> permanent molar is uh, very, very, com very, common in, uh, very common in these uh, patients to be seen. And uh, supernumerary, uh, it's uh, one of the uh, common uh, dental uh, uh, anomalies also that you can find. Uh, and that can be as usually it's an, uh, uh, su uh, supplemental if it's in a primary dentition. <coughs> oh, sorry, or it can be uh, a conical shape in a permanent dentition. Uh, and also you have the animals of the tooth shape and size. Usually they might, some of the teeth are microdontia and some of the teeth are microdontia. Very common to have in the primary dentition, you have uh, fused uh, teeth, the germination uh, or, fu or fusion, uh, but in, uh, rare, uh, less commonly in the permanent dentition. Enamel hypoplasia, uh, it's very uh, uh, common to be seen. Uh, that can be either due to the uh, uh, in environmental factors during the tooth development for the permanent dentition, uh, or it's uh, sometimes associated with some syndromes, cardiac problems, cyanosis. So there are many factors that will lead to enamel hypoplasia. Uh, you know that tooth formation, uh, it uh, can be affected with multi, it's uh, multi factors can affect the tooth formation. Uh, one of them, I mean, it's the having a, a hypoxia, uh, having uh, uh, a surgery on the site or trauma, environmental, so all these can affect. And MIH is not so commonly, it's not very important in the literature, but we commonly see that. Uh, well, and uh, I can say that around 60% of the uh, cleft lip and palate uh, patients, they do have MIH, molar incisor hypomineralization. Uh, that's also bec that's because of the uh, teeth development which happened during the first three years of life. Uh, these incisors and molars, uh, usually when the, that's a child, when uh, it goes under general anesthesia, it gets some, a lot of ear infection and takes, in, uh, takes for a long time the antibiotics. So definitely that is going to affect the molar and incisors uh, development. So most of the time we see them, they are hypomineralized. Uh, and exhibit sixes are hypomyelized and uh, ectopically erupted. So early intervention is quite important. Deep bite is very common and cross bite also. Uh, and crowding and spacing, in some areas you might have a spacing and in some areas you might have uh, a crowding. So all the, the molecules you can find in the children with the cleft lip and palate. So the dental role is start from the prenatal uh, stage. So orthodontic at this stage, they have nothing to do. Uh, pediatric dentistry, they have very supportive uh, role uh, in caring the, the parents uh, and informing the parents about the neonatal uh, treatment options like pre-surgical infant. Uh, they need to be prepared uh, other than psychologically, they need to prepare and plan. Uh, they, know, they need to know that the treatment and surgeries, they need to start uh, as early as two to three months after birth. So they need to be prepared of, uh, and, under, and aware of these uh, procedures that uh, will be uh, going to happen uh, very soon after birth. And uh, it's very important to emphasize on the importance of the minimize the transmission of the cariogenic bacteria from the parent to the child, since they are already at a high risk of uh, having dental caries. So we don't want to expose them more uh, to the uh, uh, mucus uh, uh, mutants streptococcus. Uh, and uh, during infancy also we need to take care of their airway. Uh, in cleft lip and palate, uh, usually, usually there is no concern, but feeding and nutrition, uh, it's a problem when you have a cleft, uh, a cleft lip because they don't have this, they cannot have this pressure, negative pressure and uh, for the sucking when they uh, lips, uh, they have a cleft in their lips. And uh, the, they may be able to uh, breastfeed if they, they, they have isolated cleft uh, palate. And you need to consider the changing their uh, uh, bottle, uh, the, the bottle for feeding that with the teeth. So these two bottles are uh, especially designed for this patient uh, during feeding. 
Also, the, uh, the, the pre-surgical infant orthopedics, uh, which we will uh, come to be talking more in our next slide. So this pre these are very important pre-surgical orthopedics done uh, before the surgery early in life, uh, which usually they align these um, maxillary segments uh, and creates less tension on surgical closure when they plan for surgery to close this uh, um, uh, and reduce the severity of the cleft. The appliances, uh, it's, uh, it varies. You can use the Latham appliance or you can use the alveolar molding or taping. Uh, so usually uh, at the neonatal and uh, infant, it starts the uh, first week of birth. Uh, this appliance usually is inserted and you secure it with uh, surgical tape. And uh, you have the adjustment is done weekly. Uh, so uh, this activation adjustment is uh, done very, I mean, very frequently every week or maximum every two weeks. So that will allow these segments to come together and uh, they will be, the, the, uh, will be having, so, so report that this will allow the future uh, approximation and surgery will be easier and this the success and uh, will be higher uh, and this appliance also includes uh, nasal uh, stent and uh, usually you uh, put these appliances for three to five a month uh, so still for using the uh, nasal velar molding it's, there is a controversy in the literature and uh, it's most commonly now used in the US and in the UK. We don't use it much now uh, because uh, they found that the long term uh, the, it doesn't have any uh, improvement in the occlusion. And uh, so in the mid phase and into alveolus, uh, it remained the same and same kind of uh, same treatment in long term has been provided regardless of the child had a NAM, nasal alveolar molding or no. So, uh, uh, it is basically now what we can, we can we can see with our colleagues in the uh, cleft lip and palate. It's very I mean uh, some surgeons they prefer and some uh, uh, surgeons they don't. Uh, so uh, it's very personal uh, views and uh, both will work. And using it, it's, it has some beneficial. And sometimes for the parents having these uh, appliances, it's reassuring. Uh, and uh, if, we, if we leave these cliffs uh, uh, um, open and uh, without, if we don't initiate any uh, treatment, usually the parents get a bit worried. So having these appliances, most of the time I see they are uh, reassuring for the patient, for the parents especially. So it's a lot of the correction of the flattened nose uh, before the surgery, and it also facilitates the nose repair uh, when they are uh, repairing the uh, lip as well. Uh, so there is very weak evidence on the, on the pre-surgical orthopedic, if you want, if you have to do it or no. Uh, uh, but as you can see here, there is with this paper, they uh, found out that uh, the NAM is in combination with the uh, GPP reduced the need uh, they found that it reduced the need for secondary alveolar bone grafting by 60% in patients with unilateral uh, cleft lip and palate. So uh, uh, when you have unilateral cleft lip and palate, depend on the uh, severity uh, and uh, the width of the cleft, uh, 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 the success rate of the, uh, the bone graft is affected. So the, the narrower the cleft, the higher the success, uh, success uh, of, the, uh, cleft lip, of the bone graft in the cleft the palate, unilateral cleft palate. So uh, here they found that 60% uh, of these patients, they, they uh, come to that they don't need the secondary bone grafting later on, which was interesting. And this is another paper also, they found that this NAM, uh, it facilitates the primary uh, surgical repair of the nose and uh, lip uh, to heal under the minimal tension uh, and reducing the scar formation, improving the aesthetic results. Uh, so uh, when we need to do the lip repair, that's the first surgery usually done on uh, for the cleft lip and palate patients. Uh, there is a rule of 10. Uh, when, the, when the child is 10 weeks and 10 pounds weight, and the hemoglobin level uh, to reach 10, uh, 10, that's the best time to, initiate, to do a, a first surgery of the repairing the cleft lip and palate, which is a, cleft, uh, which is a lip repair. Uh, so don't forget the rule of the 10. 
And usually that's around the uh, three to four months of age. And uh, usually the type of the uh, uh, repair that is done, or uh, it's the rotation, ad rotation uh, advanced uh, uh, procedure or flap they do just to uh, may approximate these uh, areas. But uh, still they might need some plastic surgery later on in future uh, in life. Uh, so again, uh, during the uh, infancy, uh, the palatal closure can also uh, uh, can occur when the child is six uh, six months to eighteen. So after having the first surgery, which is lip repair, then we have the palatal repair at the uh, age of six to eighteen months. Uh, it depends on the severity of the of the cleft palate, and uh, depend if it is associated with syndrome or not. In some uh, syndromes, such as uh, uh, Pierre Robin syndrome, uh, the palatal repair is uh, delayed uh, to allow the further development of the mandible uh, and improve the uh, the patency of the airway uh, uh, post operatively post surgery. Uh, so impact uh, the the impact of uh, clefting on the oral health now. So let's look now uh, how it's going to affect the oral health. Uh, we discussed the dental anomalies that uh, the uh, the the cleft lip and palate they have uh, a malocclusion, crowding, supernumerary, uh, hypodontia, hyperdontia. Uh, so uh, these children, other than having a cleft lip and palate, dentally they are really vulnerable and at high risk. Uh, so. Uh, uh, the, for the caries, there is a mixed weak, um, uh, mix, weak evidence. Uh, they found that the, the cleft lip and palate, they have uh, more caries. Uh, that's very really common sense. Why? Because uh, if you look at the tooth quality, it's much uh, lower. They might have uh, sorry, hypoplasia or hypomerization. Um, uh, and the... And the uh, uh, also the crowding, it does not uh, allow having a proper oral hygiene uh, during the early life and having the scar in the areas of the lip uh, repair uh, also will constrict the lip and that prevent uh, 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 the proper brushing of the front teeth and uh, the crossbite. And uh, some parents also, they are really worried about the traumatizing the cleft area. Uh, and they really are, they, they come and say that doctor, I cannot uh, brush. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, I'm scared of brushing near the, the teeth which are in the cleft area or near to the cleft. Uh, I'm afraid that it's caused some complications. And we usually reassure them and tell them that it's not gonna happen and it's very safe and there is no any risk of uh, brushing teeth even if the cleft is not uh, repaired fully. Uh, and the primary dentition also, they found that the uh, cleft uh, lip and palate, they have uh, 1.5 uh, more uh, DMFT score, and the permanent dentition, it's also uh, 1.3 or uh, more uh, in the cleft lip and palate. So th really they are at high risk of caries. So prevention is very important to uh, prevent these uh, uh, to occur. And going back to now, other than the dental caries, uh, if you look at the periodontal disease, uh, it's very common to have uh, gingivitis in cleft lip and uh, palate or cleft uh, uh, palate uh, only, especially in the upper area. Uh, that's because uh, it's really quite hard to brush. Uh, and if you see this patient in your clinic, even the examination on the upper anterior area, it's quite uh, difficult to examine. and. Uh, uh, when you think of the brushing, it's much, it's not easy, uh, but it's doable. Uh, we have some other alternatives of brushing the teeth, but uh, we need to give them the credit uh, of uh, that. But at the same time, we need to motivate them and uh, uh, educate them on uh, the proper brushing technique. Uh, on the periodontitis, uh, it's, there is not enough evidence on the, uh, of the, if they are at higher risk of periodontitis. Uh, but uh, if you look at the, uh, the cleft uh, uh, area, due to the bone, bony defect, uh, many teeth are, and the many teeth get uh, more periodontitis, so bone loss. Uh, other than the defect itself, the environmental or surgical procedure which is done 
uh, sometimes the teeth uh, they get some uh, weakened more periodont uh, from the uh, periodontium uh, point of view. Uh, so uh, so how so the oral health of uh, these children usually uh, with the cleft lip and palate uh, so uh, they have higher dental caries because of the anatomy of the cleft area and because of the misaligned teeth and also because of discrepancy that they have in the skeletal base uh, relationship. Uh, also, the, uh, uh, le due to the surgical repair, surgical bone grafting procedure, hypoplastic defect, scarring, and also uh, several orthodontic treatment. Uh, keep in your mind that the orthodontic treatment, they might, it might start uh, very early in life. Uh, so, uh, and having, other than having this mis misaligned teeth and crowding uh, ectopic teeth, having an appliance in mouth, that will require further efforts in, uh, uh, in maintaining the oral hygiene for these uh, children. So uh, the dental care of the children with cleft, uh, uh, usually, usually they have an increased prevalence uh, of the caries. So uh, we need to consider the higher fluoride and uh, early in life. Uh, the minimum fluoride content uh, in each toothpaste uh, uh, I mean, before the age of three, I can say that's one uh, thousand per, per, uh, part per million, uh, per million. And after uh, the age of three, uh, the minimum, uh, it should be 1,450. Uh, you can control the risk of the fluorosis if you're worried about with the amount of the toothpaste that, that you use. But keep in your mind that they are at very high risk of caries. And uh, most of them, you, they, cannot, they, are, they don't have that uh, kind of regular follow-up since they are very busy with other uh, surgeries, other follow-ups because of the ear infection, speech therapy, uh, and they have other complications. They, and every week they have one or two appointments. So uh, they, it's very common for them to miss their appointments uh, for the uh, preventive uh, measure that you do in the, your uh, dental office, like fluoride varnish or fluoride gel. Uh, so it's very important to work uh, the uh, prevention more uh, concentrate on the prevention at home than if you con uh, than concentrating more mainly in the office. Uh, uh, you can do all, all your uh, preventive measures uh, when they come and visit you, but don't forget the most important prevention. It's, it's for them. It's where it's at home. Uh, uh, don't, the oral hygiene and diet counseling is very important. Uh, their, teeth is, their teeth are already weakened by hypoplasia and hypomerization. So reducing the, uh, the teeth, which uh, reduce the pH in the mouth, it's very important. And also uh, we need to familiarize, familiarize them too very early with the dental environment uh, because uh, these children will, go and will be visiting the dentist uh, very early in their life and they, their behavior, uh, usually they visit uh, dentists 10 times more than the, uh, in the normal individuals. Uh, and uh, uh, having in mind that they keep on going, to going through many surgeries and uh, uh, visiting different uh, the, uh, physicians with different procedures, uh, many, most of them, they are uh, coming already with an anxiety uh, to see you. So working on the uh, having an, a child-friendly dental environment is very important. And the, the, uh, due to surgery, due to scars, and due to care left, usually most of them, the sulcus depth, uh, uh, usually it's very shallow. That's a challenge uh, if you want to work. Uh, and uh, also when you, uh, also the other challenge is that when you're working with the, ch with the child, uh, is the cleft area. Uh, they they get gag they have high gagging reflex and the water might uh, go through the communication if the cleft palate is not fully repaired uh, the water will be communicated between uh, nose and and uh, oral cavity and that's really annoying to them so my suggestion for that is to use a rubber dam or dental dam uh, for these children whenever you are using uh, 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 any uh, hand piece or any uh, you, uh, three airway syringe. Uh, because that's very uncomfortable for them. But keep in your mind that most of them, they have nasal blockage. 
So we'll be very careful when you're using the rubber dam, uh, try to use a sectional or keep it uh, open from one side so they can uh, breathe because most of them, you find them, they are mouth breather uh, because of the nose deformity and the nasal polyps, uh, they are mouth breather. So that's a modified brushing uh, technique uh, that you use. Uh, one of the instructions just to, you have to tell them to raise the lip uh, and brush the teeth uh, because normally they cannot do that because of the stiffness of the scarring on the lip. And the other alternative is that to, uh, to ask them, especially if they have uh, crowding and they have teeth on the cleft area, to ask them to use the interdental brushes, uh, like you see in this picture, to clean their teeth. Uh, since they, have, uh, they are at high risk of dental caries, it's very common that you see that uh, they lose their, their primary teeth very early and usually the complication that is associated with that is uh, it's worsen their uh, space condition and the space loss and uh, uh, the compli it complicates the future orthodontic uh, treatment. So it's very important that to try to preserve the teeth as much as you can, and that's uh, guaranteed by having a good preventive measures early in life. Uh, and also it is uh, preferable to restore the uh, primary molars with the stainless steel crown. Uh, uh, the best is to use now a whole technique, then, uh, then extract them. A uh, whole technique will provide the child-friendly, less uh, time, no local anesthesia, uh, but if you're using on the E, uh, keep in your mind that most of the time sixers uh, will erupt in a topic eruption. So try to use it as small as possible or if the charge is cooperative enough and you can use a handpiece with the water, uh, you can uh, do the, I uh, highly suggest you to use the modified hole or conventional stainless steel crown uh, to uh, reduce the chance of uh, possible ectopic eruption uh, in these children. And uh, always, uh, uh, we have to monitor the uh, incisor relationship because of the scar that they have on the uh, upper uh, uh, lip uh, and the constriction and due to collapse that they get when they have the cleft area. Usually the teeth, they collapse, and the, the jaw collapse and it, so they usually they have the uh, class three incisor uh, relationship. Uh, and the fissure seal the molars and premolars as soon as they erupt. And uh, mind that the, uh, the lateral incisors in the alveolar area, uh, in, uh, this 50% of the cases, it's missing. So they have hypodontia and think of the uh, replacement uh, and with or, uh, you need to work interdisciplinary with your ortho orthodontist to see how can you manage the missing lateral uh, either you would do your uh, bone grafting earlier and you allow the uh, uh, canine to erupt in the area of the lateral and that's a natural space closure. Uh, so whenever you want to do any restoration, consider child behavior and age and use the, the minimal intervention dentistry. Uh, uh, we are using SDF a lot for treating their teeth and we are using whole technique uh, and uh, atraumatic restoration with close follow-up. Uh, so try to be, uh, to have very minimal intervention and child-friendly uh, to consider their behavior and uh, future acceptance in case of any emergency. Uh, also the caries management should be uh, carried up before any orthodontic treatment and keep in your mind that uh, they should be fit for ortho treatment uh, from the oral hygiene uh, uh, perspective and the dental caries and plug. Uh, keep in your mind that the enamel uh, quality and quantity is lower in these cases. So whenever you are using adhesive restorations, uh, keep in your mind that, that your, bond, uh, your bonding might be affected due to the uh, poor enamel quality. And always consider the cost effectiveness of the treatment that you are doing. Uh, these children usually they go uh, through many treatments, many surgeries, and uh, the uh, doing a cost-effective treatment, considering the cost in your treatment, and discussing that with the parents in advance is quite uh, uh, appreciative for parents uh, when you do that. Uh, 
so uh, during the primary dentition, you have to reassure them, uh, the, the parents, and inform uh, and prevent anklematize the children. Uh, so that basically it's uh, the behavioral management uh, and proper diet and oral hygiene. Uh, avoid extraction uh, if it is possible and keep up the, with the medications. Um, many of, I mean, 20% of the cleft lip and palate are associated with syndrome. So uh, keep in your mind that they might have other systemic or uh, medical conditions uh, and communicate with kind of facial team uh, 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 very closely. In a mixed dentition, uh, where we have our interceptive orthodontist, usually that's the expansion period of the secondary alveolar bone graft. Uh, what happens in the cleft lip and palate is uh, the cleft area collapse and the area of, for, the, for the, uh, the bone graft is very small or it's an inadequate for the canine uh, to er erupt that. So uh, expansion is quite helpful in that uh, uh, instance. Uh, so the, also uh, we need to consider the anterior cross bite uh, correction, either we use the face mask or removal appliances. Uh, and we as a pediatric dentist, uh, for us the most important thing is to have, to maintain the oral hygiene and brushing and uh, pit and fissure sealants of the molars. So bone grafting, it, uh, it has many advantage, as you can see. So uh, it's quite important uh, to uh, uh, do the bone grafting uh, only in an uh, ideal time uh, when you can get the maximum benefit. Uh, and that's before eruption of the, uh, of the uh, cuspid or the lateral incisor. Uh, when, when is the best time to do? Usually when the, uh, the canine roots are either half or two third form, and usually that's between the age of uh, uh, seven to 10, and what in most of the cases we do that at around the age of nine. Uh, and if you have to do it earlier, if the lateral incisor is, uh, 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 present. So that's the case that you can see here the cleft uh, uh, area and after expansion uh, you created enough room for the bone graph and here the bone graph has been placed and now the canine uh, can erupt uh, uh, in a, a bony uh, struct alveolar uh, area. So, we highly recommend uh, taking OPG, uh, usually at the age of seven, uh, the, because and you can see at that stage, uh, we, that's the early mixed dentition stage, uh, uh, maybe you might have any uh, uh, supernumerary teeth in the cleft area, or to rule out uh, if there are, you have hypodontia, uh, because in case that you have hypodontia, especially when the lateral is uh, missing, then you might, as we said earlier, you might uh, uh, do your bone graft earlier at that stage uh, to allow the canine to erupt in, in the area of the lateral. So here you can see the both upper laterals are uh, missing, so the bone graft was placed earlier, but uh, before that is the palatal expansion. We do the palatal expansion before the bone graft. Uh, and also uh, during mixed dentition, as we said, to correct the uh, malocclusion, uh, we use the face mask, which is also called the reverse pull uh, headgear. And here that you can see that after four months of uh, reverse uh, full headgear, that you can see that the occlusion has been uh, corrected and we, the maxilla has been advanced. Uh, keep in your mind that after, uh, other than bone grafting at the age of seven to eight, there are many other uh, surgeries that uh, need to be done later in life. Uh, after uh, the cleft palate uh, surgery, 10% of the cases, they uh, end up with having a fistula. Uh, and later in life, uh, usually at the age of seven to 10, or sometimes with the bone grafting, you might consider uh, repairing the uh, fistula. Uh, and the nasal tip, usually it's, it's uh, uh, reconstructed at the school age. And uh, when the child is eight to 10 years, as we say that we do the bone graft. And the final repair, repair of the lip and palate uh, also it's done during the child's mid-teens age. Uh, and uh, usually at, when they need to have uh, also regular hearing checkup because the hearing, most, in many cases, the hearing is uh, impaired. So in permanent dentition, uh, 
now uh, in, we delegate most of the uh, our job to our uh, colleagues in orthodontic department now uh, they need to go through a uh, comprehensive ortho orthodontic uh, treatment uh, that involve uh, correcting either anterior posterior uh, relationship uh, or uh, uh, transverse uh, relations in case of they have crossbite uh, uh, in these cases or uh, in correction of the uh, uh, hypodontia uh, or spacing all done at this stage, uh, final stage when they are at the permanent uh, dentition. Uh, in the, from, uh, for, for us as a pediatric dentist, it's very important to maintain the oral health uh, during orthodontic treatment and uh, educate about the hypocalcification of the teeth uh, and hypomineralization also. It's very common to have in this case, so how to maintain them uh, with having orthodontic treatment, uh, it's very important. So uh, now we come to the conclusion, as we, say, we discussed, uh, the Kelly Flip and Palette, it's uh, really an interdisciplinary team. You need to have your team and you need to uh, communicate with your team uh, very closely. And uh, it, it starts from the prenatal uh, stage uh, up to the uh, adulthood. So uh, you need to consider many aspects uh, uh, for the, to, when you're planning uh, your treatment. Uh, uh, for us as a pediatric dentist, uh, it's very important to, to look how the child is being fed. So feeding might be, uh, might be difficult for these children and we need to consider that these children, um, uh, their diet has not been changed uh, due to their feeding uh, behavior. So it's very important to uh, look into their diet because uh, uh, the, their feeding is not uh, uh, very easy and comfortable for the uh, parents to feed them. So many times they uh, uh, change their diet, make it more uh, calories and with high sugar, uh, 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 high sugar content uh, because of the taste and they uh, uh, prize, that's a prize uh, to them. If they do brushing, they get a lot of uh, present with the uh, chocolate, chocolates and the lollipops. So we need to consider their feeding and their diet and consider their hearing in your practice. Uh, many of them, they might have hearing, uh, hearing impairment. Uh, so uh, in these cases, uh, communication is very really quite important when you communicate with your children. Uh, since they cannot hear you well, you need to make sure that they understand uh, what the procedures that you are going to do. The normal tell, uh, show, do, the tell uh, component might not uh, work. So <coughs> you have to show them uh, uh, every step, demonstrate that uh, to them to gain their trust. And consider the psychology uh, and refer to the social workers if needed. And uh, make sure that, that you exclude any safeguarding and neglect. Uh, it's very common to have the child abuse, uh, child abuse uh, for children with the with these uh, impairments and uh, uh, these conditions. Uh, so it's very important to rule out any child neglect or any child abuse. And the most important thing for us is the prevention to start very early to we tr try to preserve the teeth and uh, because even uh, extraction of the teeth we will lose the bone. So if you extract the teeth very early in life, uh, you won't have that uh, high quality bone uh, for the uh, bone grafting uh, or, uh, or the correction of this of the, uh, the uh, cleft uh, later on. And if you have teeth on the cleft area, and if you want to extract them, uh, it's preferable to extract them within, I mean, three to six months uh, before the, uh, the bone graft. Uh, why is that? Uh, first of all, if you do it too early, you will, will have the bone uh, collapse and bone loss. Uh, that's not good for the uh, bone grafting. And if you do it too late, uh, uh, the, there won't be any healing. So you would have the socket of the tooth, uh, which require far more of the bone grafting. So to allow proper uh, healing, so better to extract the teeth on the cleft area, uh, three to six months before the bone grafting to allow proper healing of the bone and uh, not to lose the bone uh, if uh, due to early extraction of these uh, baby teeth. 
So I hope that uh, it was uh, uh, not boring to you. I know this topic, it has a lot to talk about, but uh, I try to uh, concentrate on the, our role in pediatric and uh, our colleagues in orthodontists uh, so uh, to know exactly what we are going to do. So thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Uh, and please uh, go ahead if you have any questions and you can email me if uh, you want any further doc any uh, guideline or any uh, articles uh, I can share it with you uh, at any time just email me um, thank you very much uh, dr. Anas for a won wonderful very informative presentation it was really clear all the points and it's uh, really a challenge to treat these kind of patients and uh, it's really important to have uh, a very good team to deal with these cases. Uh, we can start with the first question. Um, there is a question about stem cells. Uh, could it be used to improve the palatal repair? Uh, definitely, in the stem cell has a big role in that, but uh, I haven't come to across any study that they use a stem cell for the uh, palatal repair. That would be very interesting to know. Uh, but a stem cell uh, has a role in any kind of defects. Uh, and uh, uh, I mean, to, uh, to answer that, there are some uh, the intrauterine surgery done to repair that. So uh, the future, uh, future of the Califlipan palate is that they do the repair before the child, uh, uh, before, the, before birth. So uh, before, uh, I mean, uh, the, now the uh, surgery or the advancement in our surgery that we have, uh, we can repair the surgery before birth. So hopefully we don't need uh, the, but that's still under the studies. So. Uh, uh, in few areas of the world, they are doing that in triuterine surgery, uh, but uh, could have, but the stem cells definitely would have. I haven't seen any cases that has been treated with uh, the stem cells. It will be really interesting to know if uh, the, this will work. Uh, another question we have is: uh, What's the best time to close the cleft lip, and what's the best time to close the cleft palate? Uh, for the cleft lip, it is start earlier in life, during the three to six months. Usually, as we say, the roll of the, the 10, when the charge is at, during the, at the 10 weeks and 10 pounds and the hemoglobin is 10, uh, it's start earlier. And for the cleft palate, as we say, depend on the severity of the cleft palate uh, and plus minus if it's associated with the syndrome or no, uh, you will start uh, from, you can do it from the six month to 12 month. And one more important thing that we consider that is the airway. Uh, so, and like in, as you said, in Pierre Robin syndrome and in some syndromes, uh, the airway might be compromised after surgery if you do it too early. So you need to wait for some uh, development of the mandible so to have the patency of the airway. So that's one of the, uh, the other than the cleft size, it's to look at the airway. Uh, so uh, to decide what, what is the best time. Okay, great. Uh, another question, how can we manage hypoplastic teeth in cleft patients? Uh, well, yeah, that's a very important question to, uh, because these teeth, they, uh, the children, they have uh, hypoplasia. Uh, in, uh, so in case of hypoplasia, we can use uh, co uh, uh, adhesive restoration, uh, but uh, the aesthetic will be, might be compromised. Uh, so uh, since the, the enamel quality is good, but the quantity is low, so uh, adhesive restoration is one of the uh, cases, uh, but in, in uh, one of the treatment options. But in most of the cases, uh, usually you can see the hypoplasia and hypomolization mixed in one tooth. So uh, a full coverage, if it's a primary molar or if uh, the, it's the first permanent molar, uh, full coverage with sensitive steel crown is my preferable treatment option. Great. Um, there is uh, one question about uh, um, uh, one is surprised to know that the most important part of the cliff lip palate team in the UK is the nurses. So, what do you think about that? 
Sorry, Dr. Can... Mo, I couldn't, you, you're, you were lagging the connection, but I couldn't hear you well. Uh, the most that? important part of the cleft lip palate team in UK is the nurses. So what's your comment on that? Uh, yes, uh, I do agree that in the UK, the nurses, uh, they are the first uh, to uh, greet these children. So uh, uh, most of our behavioral management is done by the, the, uh, the nurses there. And they are the one of the, uh, they are involved in the counseling and oral hygiene instructions uh, when, when it's come to oral hygiene instructions and counseling. So they are one of the important uh, members in the, in the nurses are in the cleft lip and palate. Uh, they really have a good, uh, uh, they do put a lot of effort in the behavioral management. Uh, surgeons are too busy. Uh, they don't uh, have the, that time or they don't uh, usually put that much of effort, unfortunately, in the behavioral management. So we can see most of the, uh, these cases are uh, the behaviorally managed uh, initially by the uh, nurses. And also one of more important role of the nurses in the UK is to uh, exclude if there are any safeguarding issue or neglect. Uh, there are uh, nurses specialized in that. So uh, they really look into the, if, to that if the child is um, uh, having any uh, suspicious to be uh, neglected, either oral, or either oral, ne oral or dental neglect, negligence, or the, uh, the general health of the child is neglected. So uh, they are the first uh, individual usually too, because they have the, all the data of the child. So they are the first person just to, uh, if they found any suspicious case of neglect and uh, safeguarding issue, to report it to the uh, social workers. Okay, I think because of the time, uh, we will just have the last question. Uh, how can we manage uh, deep bite in these patients? Uh, usually, the, because of the uh, uh, deep bite is due to the cross bite and uh, uh, class three, uh, class three, and collapse, uh, class three inside the relationship and collapse of the maxilla. Uh, the maxillary expansion and the uh, uh, correction of the cross bite usually it's uh, correct the uh, the deep bite and uh, with having usually uh, deep bite it stays only until the, the during the uh, the mixed dentition stage. And uh, the final correction is, which usually it's minimal deep bite you have when you reach to the permanent dentition. Uh, if the uh, uh, skeletal uh, correction has, is done earlier in life, so if, the, uh, if you have done the uh, skeletal correction of the uh, expansion and correction of the posterior cross bite and advancement of the uh, maxilla is done earlier in life, uh, usually that gets corrected during mixed dentition. A minimal correction is usually required by a fixed orthodontist later uh, during the permanent dentition. Great, thank you very much. I think thank you so much. Uh, to start with our second uh, presenter. Thank you very much, Dr. Anas, for being with us, for accepting uh, to give uh, our your presentation in our webinar society um, sessions and uh, hope you stay with us till the end of the second presentation. Uh, Dr. Ali, can you take over? Thank you very much. Dr. Ali Zahrani. Thank you, Dr. Amir. Um, Dr. Ali Zahrani, I think you need to unmute, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Amana. Yes, uh, yes. Okay. Uh, we can hear. On behalf of the Saudi Society of Pediatric Dentistry, uh, we'd like to uh, welcome our distinguished speaker, Dr. Ahmed Masoud. Uh, Dr. Ahmed is a clinical assistant professor at King Abdelaziz University. He is a diplomat of American Board of Orthodontics, and he had the PhD in neuroscience and the steep from uh, University of Illinois uh, at Chicago, and he uh, is their uh, junket professor. Dr. Masoud is a reviewer for many art uh, journals like 
the Angle Orthodontics and the American Journal of Orthodontic and Dentofacial uh, Orthopedic. He has invited to speak in uh, uh, international uh, meetings such as the American Association of Orthodontics and the World Sleep Congress and the American Academy of Dental Sleep of Medicine and uh, where he has the award, the Graduate uh, Student Research Award. Dr. Musaud tonight will speak about maxillary canine impactions. Working to get together is a success. I uh, would like to welcome Dr. Masoud and for any questions or comment to the speaker, please send it to the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. Father Dr. Masoud. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me properly? Yeah, yeah, fine. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. And thank you very much, Dr. Anas, a very sensitive and important topic. As you, as yourself and Dr. Manal said, it's uh, having a good craniofacial team that works well together, I think is the most important thing. And this flows well with the, with the general message of my presentation that working together is success. So uh, this is the outline of this webinar tonight. Uh, we'll start with the definition and etiology of canine impactions, maxillary canine impactions. So what's an impacted tooth? An impacted tooth is an intraosseous position of this tooth after the expected time of eruption. Uh, in contrast, a displaced tooth is an anomalous infraosseous position of the tooth before the expected time of eruption. Uh, the canine uh, is considered impacted in general if it's delayed beyond the age of 14 to 50. This is the most used definition. However, there are other definitions. There are multiple definitions, but these are two of the more, most other common ones. An impaction is, defi is defined as a failed eruption of a tooth with a completely developed root. So if you see here, even this canine root, if it's developed, even if this patient is 10 or 11, it's considered impacted based on that definition. And another definition is if further eruption may not take place based on clinical or, radi or radiographic diagnosis. So if you look at the third molar here, again, even if this patient was 15 or 16, you don't expect this tooth to erupt. So based on their definition that we, so we call this uh, an impacted tooth. So again, uh, dental age uh, will differ based on your reference. I have this from uh, Wheeler's Dental Anatomy. I use this because this is the easiest to memorize. So uh, in general, the maxillary canines erupt at the same time as the second molars at age 12. And this is, the dental, I mean, the eruption timing. So at age six, you get lower centrals and first molars, seven upper centrals, lower laterals, eight upper laterals, nine lower canine, 10, 11 first and second premolars. And finally, at age 12, you get the canines and the second molar. So that's the age you should look for the canine. I mean, look for the canine to erupt, not start looking for the canine. So, the etiology of maxillary canines uh, impaction has is several factors. Uh, these are some of the factors. First is insufficient space. However, this is a main factor in labial impactions, not a really a uh, factor in palatal canine impactions. The second is factors related to the primary canine. So the primary canine fails to resorb or is lost too early, that can result in an impacted maxillary canine. The third is factors related to the maxillary lateral incisor. So if the maxillary lateral incisor is absent, uh, is malformed, uh, hasn't erupted in time, that can be a reason to get a maxillary canine impaction. The fourth is factors related to the maxillary canine itself, if it's dilacerated or if it's ankylosed. And finally, genetics. So as you see here, this is the basic classic uh, picture of a, a palatal canine impaction. If, as you can see here, there is enough space for the canine to develop. This is of course a primary canine, the, canine, the, the permanent canine is here. So there is space, but it's still not in. Uh, so as you can see here, 85% of palatally impacted canines have sufficient space. So insufficient space is mainly a factor in labially impacted canines. There are two uh, major theories for uh, the development of canine impaction. The first is the guidance theory. The guidance theory says that the canine erupts along the root of the lateral incisor. If the root is absent or malformed, the canine will not erupt. So what I tell the students, just to make it easier to remember, imagine the canine is a beautiful princess waiting for Prince Charming to come and sweep her off her feet. 
So Prince Charming is the latter incisor. If the latter incisor or Prince Charming doesn't show up, is late, has a malformed face, a malformed body, then our princess will go upstairs, stay in her room and won't come down. The second theory is the genetic theory. So genetics are the main origin of palatally displaced canines. Uh, this just links several, I mean, things, observations we see. So if we have a missing or small lateral, uh, there is genetic correlation between that and an impacted maxillary canine. So based on this theory, the missing lateral isn't physically the reason for the impaction of the maxillary canine. It's not that the maxillary canine wants to erupt along the route, it's just linked by genetics. Uh, another thing uh, is enamel hyperplasia is also seen with maxillary impactions, infraocclusion of primary molars, and finally congenitally missing premolars. Next, we'll talk about the prevalence and sequelae of um, auxiliary canine impactions. So auxiliary canines are the second most commonly impacted teeth, second, of course, only to the third molars. Uh, they have a long path of eruption and erupt slates. So 2% of the population has uh, impacted auxiliary canines. They're twice as common in females as in males. They're more common in the maxilla and two thirds of them are palatally, so palatal impactions are more common than labial, and uh, most of them are unilateral. So to remember the prevalence, I always just look at this picture. So this has the general prevalence, uh, so a female, palatal, maxillary, unilateral. So if you just remember this, you'll remember it's more common in female, maxilla, palatal, and unilateral. So what about lower canines? Although this isn't the topic today, but lower canines are much less common, 0.1% to 0.4%. So the maxillary is five to 20 times more common. However, ironically, this year, I've seen six lower canine impactions. Uh, of course, if I have six, then ideally I should have, based on their prevalence, I should have seen 3,000 to 6,000 cases this year, and I can assure you that's not the case. Uh, I think I'm just lucky that I'm getting a lot of these canine impactions. So the sequelae, usually canine impactions are asymptomatic. However, you can get things that develop, such as a cyst, an infection, root resorption, migration of neighboring teeth, loss of arch length, and loss of attachment. So as you see here, this isn't my case, but this is an interesting case report. This is a cyst related to the canine. You can see how massive this cyst is. Of course, they took it out along with the canine. Uh, so if the patient is younger, not an adult, I think canine impaction should be managed as soon as possible. As the patient grows some 30, 40 year olds, if the canine is there, it's asymptomatic, you can at least watch it. But in general, managing canine should be done as soon as possible. Second is root resorption, as you can see here. They usually resorb the lateral incisor, but in this case, it's actually resorbing both central incisors. And this also shows it. Third, loss of arch length. You don't have the canine, so the teeth tend to drift forward. The molar, the premolars drift forward. This side becomes class two, and you have crowding now. And then loss of attachment. As you're pulling the impacted canine into the arch, uh, you might get loss of attachment, loss of gingiva, loss of bone. And so before you start, always tell the patient, I mean, this may result. I can't promise you the canine will look beautiful, but you might have this, you might need the gingival graft. So based on all this, that's why managing canine impactions should be a collaboration between all dental specialties. So GD and PD uh, or PDU are, are you, uh, I mean, are in a proper position to diagnose and intervene early. The oral surgeon is needed to expose and bond or extract if needed. Uh, the orthodontic, of course, is for traction and perio for a flap, a gingival plasty or gingivectomy, or even a gingival graft if we have loss of attachment. Next, we'll go into clinical and radiographic diagnosis. So the first step is to diagnose the impacted canine clinically. So what do you have to look for? Look for an over-retained primary canine. Look for a bulge, a labial bulge. You have to start looking for the labial budget bulge at age nine or 10. So if you don't see a bulge, that doesn't mean the canine is impacted, of course. If you don't see the bulge, uh, there might be an eruption disturbance. So you have to take further investigation, take an x-ray, 
So of course, it doesn't mean that the canine is impacted, but if you take an X-ray, you see the canine looking like this, then you can tell the patient, okay, there is an impacted canine, we want to start doing something. And this is what the canine bulge looks like. This patient is 12. It's, he's slightly, I mean, this is the proper time that the canine should come in, so you should find this bulge. Third is a palatal bulge. If you don't see the canine, run your finger across the palate. Uh, you'll feel, so here there is a canine impacted here, a palatal canine impaction, and you'll see that this side is bulging more than this side. With your finger, you can probably even feel it more than, than see it. And finally, distal crown tipping of the lateral incisor. So why does this happen? This patient is 12 years old. If you look at the pan, the canine pushes against the lateral root, so the crown goes uh, distal. However, what happens if you see this distal crown tipping at age eight? If at age eight, it doesn't mean anything because uh, we all know, of course, I'm speaking to the other dentist that this is the ugly duckling stage. So the crown of the lateral should be tipping distally, but as the, patient, as the canines erupt, it should then become straight. If like this patient, he's 12, you still see this, then there is something wrong. So these are the four factors you look for during clinical diagnosis. What about radiogra radiographic diagnosis? Radiographs are key to evaluate canine eruption. You want to know if it's displaced, if it's uh, where is it erupting. Second, you want to evaluate the root of the lateral incisor or even the central incisor. Is there resorption or not? Uh, you want to take an, an x-ray to, to, to know where you should, or mainly the surgeon, where the surgeon should go in for for, uh, to access the canine. Is it labially? Is it palatal? Is it behind the central? Is it behind the premolar? And finally, we as orthodontists want to know where we should, which direction we should pull the canine in. Sometimes you need to pull it distally, sometimes you need to pull it laterally first, so it depends on how the canine is positioned. Uh, these are the x-rays we take to, uh, to diagnose our impacted canines. The first and mostly com most commonly used, of course, is the panoramic. So in the panoramic, you want to evaluate four things. You want to see how the canine is in relation to the lateral. Is it overlapping the root of the lateral incisor or not? You want to evaluate the vertical position of the canine relative to the lateral, and then the angle, and then the apex. So we'll talk more about that in evaluating prognosis of the impacted canines. But these four things, when you look at the pan, you need to look at these four things. What about CEPs? So CEPs aren't uh, really alone, not a diagnostic tool for a canine, impacted canine, but, but it can help along with a pen. So at age eight or nine, the maxillary canine should be parallel to the maxillary central incisor. So here it's normal. Well, if we look at this Ceph, you can see this canine going out almost through the nose. So of course we know this is not normal. And this can also help you in terms of where to, uh, to access for, for exposure. So you don't wanna go in the palate. Here you might need to go from the labial tie the canine here and then bring it down. And next, periapicals. So periapicals, you need them and you need to use the buccal object rule. I'm sure most of you are aware of that. Same lingual opposite buccal, slob. So you take one x-ray and then you take another x-ray. If the cone moves distal and the crown moves distal, then the object you're looking at is lingual. And always, because this gets confusing when you're looking at two x-rays, you want to evaluate which one was taken first. So I always do this regardless of how many times I do it. Always fill the blank. Cone moved blank, object moved blank. So I'll show you what that means. So this is an impacted canine. We want to know if this is palatal or buccal. So let's start with the general object, uh, the buccal object rule. So the main idea is you're, to you're taking an image of two images that are superimposed against each other. As you move the cone distally, the palatal object should move distally. So same lingual, and then the, op the, bu the buccal object should move in the opposite direction. And this is the classical example. So this premolar has two canals. Of course, we only see one. So you take another periapical, and how do you evaluate if you went mesial or distal? So here I can see the canine, three, four, and five. Here I see the two, so which means the cone moved mesial. And then I see two canals now. So this canal here that moved mesially, moved in the same direction, is the palatal. So the cone moved mesial, the object moved mesial, so this object is the palatal object. In terms of canine, again, uh, here, 
the we see up to the central lateral. So we took another image and we can see central lateral premolars, which means the cone moved distal. Now we look at the canine. The canine here is touching the central. Here is it's not touching the central, so that means the canine also moved distal. So the canine, the cone moved distal, the object moved distal, then the impaction, of course, is palatal. The third uh, uh, image we use is the occlusal image. So the occlusal uh, radiograph, of course, the best 2D image for evaluating of labiolingual, labiolingual position. CBCTs, of course, are better, but not every center, not every office has access to a CBCT. So if you don't, uh, occlusal images can be very useful. And last but not least, of course, CBCT scans. They're very important to locate the canine accurately to assess the damage uh, or resorption, access for surgical procedure, direction of orthodontic forces, and amount of bone surrounding each tooth. Uh, it comes with some disadvantages. The cost is slightly, I mean, it is more expensive than a 2D image. Uh, access, like I said, not every center has access to CBCT. The radiation dose is higher. It can be two to three times, sometimes four times the, the radiation of a pen and acquisition time. However, nowadays this isn't a big factor because CBCTs are getting faster and faster. So let's look at this patient. So this patient has a canine here that's displaced at least, if not impacted. You take a periapical, you can't see anything. You take a CBCT, you can tell accurately where the, this uh, canine is coming. It's coming above the lateral, tilting mesially. So you can, you can perfectly diagnose this, this canine. Another case, you look at the pan, it's resorbing the centrals. Take a CBCT, you can navigate. It's, 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 I mean, the root of the lateral and the central is completely gone. So in a case like this, if you see the CBCT, you'll probably say, well, we're extracting both of these and just bringing the canine in their place. And uh, like I said, access for surgical procedure and direction of application. So again, the pan, you can't know where you wanna access buccal or palatal. You see here, it's definitely easy for the surgeon to know where to access the, the canine. And in terms of orthodontics, I need to know where I'm pulling the tooth. So here, I can't just pull the tooth labially. I'm hitting the, the root of the lateral. The first step is to pull it distally until I'm away from the lateral incisor, and then I go labially. Uh, this is another case of the CBCT uh, scan. So. Again, it's very high above the lateral, central. As you can see here, it's touching. Again, same thing, I pull the canine away from the inside. So you need to know the proper uh, direction of force. And because of course CBCT scans are 3D images, you can see things that, that you usually don't see with pans. So this was one of my uh, CBCTs during my PhD, one of my research subjects. So if you look here, you can't see anything. I don't, I mean, if, if anyone else can see it, I'm impressed, but I can't see anything that's happening here. I feel everything looks okay. Uh, I was doing the CBCT to evaluate the airway. So we look here, you find two teeth here, two supernumerary, either supernumerary or impacted canines. But you look here, they're more clear. They look like they're two teeth running away from the mouth. And so incidental findings are important with the CBCT scans. So that's why CBCT scans are a double-edged sword. Although they give you very important information that help you in terms of diagnosis, if you take it, you need to properly evaluate the CBCT scans. Because some, some practitioners nowadays take it routinely and don't look except at the thing they wanna look at. If there is something that you missed, you are held accountable. So you're legally required to look at everything in the CBCT scan. Uh, next, we're gonna talk about prognosis. So uh, this is what I was talking about when you're looking at the pan. These four factors you need to memorize. So overlap of the lateral incisor, the vertical height, the angulation, and the position of the apex. So in terms of poor diagnosis, if, if the canine is completely overlapping the lateral, is completely above the apex of the lateral incisor, is 30 degrees relative to the midline, 30 degrees or more, or the apex is above the second premolar, then <clears throat> this maxillary canine infection has poor prognosis. So let's look at examples. So this patient here has a canine that's impacted. Uh, 
if you look at relative to this table we said, so it's not overlapping the lateral. Uh, it's not above halfway above the lateral, so it's it's just within halfway the root the root length of the lateral. The angle is not that bad; it's 15 to 30, and the apex is almost above the premolar. So this has a good to average prognosis. This was easy; we just opened space, and the canine came came, came down without even exposing. What about this case? We look here. We look at the overlap, completely overlapping the lateral incisor. Uh, it's not very high, which is good. So it's halfway uh, uh, the, the length of the lateral incisor. The angle is bad. It's above 30 degrees. And the apex is above the premolar, which is acceptable. So this was an average case. This case took about two years. Uh, was a palatal canine infection. Other case, so if you look at this case, the overlap is complete. So this is poor in terms of overlap. The height, it's high, but it's still not above the apex, so it's, it's here. Uh, the angle is good. It's, it's less than 15 degrees, and the apex is good. So this case uh, was not very hard, but we opened space. It didn't come down, but because it's very high, we needed, of course, to surgically expose it. Another case, let's look here. Overlap is bad. I mean, poor prognosis, so it's overlapping the lateral and even some on the central. The height is above the half of the root of the lateral. The angle is over, uh, over 30 degrees. The apex is above the four. So in terms of prognosis, this is average. Here we just opened it, exposed it just with a gingivectomy. So this was an, a very easy exposure. And uh, here you see this canine, this is not common. So here we have uh, the overlap, of course, is nothing. It's perfect in terms of overlap, overlapping the lateral incisor. It's not overlapping the lateral incisor at all. The height, it's a bit high. The angle is great. However, the apex is above the five. And in cases like this, where you have one of the factors being very poor prognosis, it might throw off the whole case. So here, I don't know of any orthodontist who might try and bring this here. So here you have two options, either extract it or bring it in the place of the five. And finally, this case, so in terms of overlap, overlapping the lateral and the central, uh, the height, it's a bit high, the angle is bad, and the apex is good. However, as we said, one factor here, the overlap was, was very poor. So it's, it's not just overlapping the lateral or the central, it's overlapping the central on the other side. So in this case here, we need to extract this canine. Okay, next, we'll go into interceptive management. So the ideal form of treatment with best long-term results for impacted canines is early interceptive management. So examples include extraction of the primary canine or resolving crowding by expansion or braces. This is a key article. I think every dentist should know this uh, paper. So it's by Erickson and Kroll, 1988. They, uh, this study was done on PANS, and they found when they extracted the primary canine, if the canine, the permanent canine, was distal to the midline of the lateral incisor, it came down in its position 91% of the time. If the permanent canine was beyond the midline of the lateral incisor, and you extract the primary canine, there's a 64% chance that the canine will drop in its place. Of course, chances of normal eruption decrease if the angle is above 30 degrees. So let's look at this case. Let's look at two canines here. This canine is overlapping the lateral. So here, there is overlap. You, they, uh, we, the canine was extracted, the primary C was extracted, no orthodontic treatment whatsoever. The canine came in perfectly in its position. Next is resolving crowding by expansion or braces. So uh, you need to create space to assist in canine eruption. Again, remember, crowding is more important uh, in palate and in label impactions. So expansion or braces with a coil, you need to create space to have the canines come in. With expansion, you can use any type of expander. I'm um, fortunate to have used all these types of expanders. They all, they all have different advantages or disadvantages, but uh, the main objective is just to create space, and they all create space. So let's look at this case. Here, the canine is, is also impacted. Here, we just use braces to open the space because this is an easy impaction. Canine came in perfectly, very nicely. 
Let's look at another case. So this was an eight year, a nine year old boy. Uh, the canine is not ectopic. However, you don't have any space for the canine. So if we just leave the canine as it is, it might get displaced, it might get impacted. So we just did a two by four open space, at least so the canine now has enough space to erupt. So we'll just give the patient a retainer, have the canines come in and this patient might not need orthodontic treatment at all. So two by four might have been enough. Okay, so these were examples. However, you, of course you can combine these two. You can extract and expand or, or open space. So let's look at this case. This is a case with a very ectopically erupting canine, overlapping the lateral, the angle is bad. Uh, and it's not very high, but this is, uh, has an average to poor prognosis. Uh, the, extra the C's were extracted and the uh, arch was expanded. No braces, if you see here the angle, went from almost 45 degrees to almost 10 degrees. Nothing, it just, I mean, fixed itself on its own. So this is very important. And I think pediatric dentists should attempt to, to properly diagnose these. And I think they are. The angle improved very much. Okay, this is another very interesting case. Look at this nine-year-old boy, or girl, sorry. The canine is almost horizontal. So, and if, they, if this patient was an adult, this is a very, very hard case. But this is a nine-year-old girl, so you can extract the C, but again, you don't have space for the four. So in this case, the C's and Z and D were extracted. Again, I'm gonna show you, this has no orthodontic treatment whatsoever. It's amazing how the canine just, the four came down and then the canine just shifted and went down very nicely. This is uh, a cousin of mine. That's why this is a, a case close to my heart. So I saw this uh, patient at six, 26 years. He was living abroad and he came to me and I saw the canine. I'm gonna show you them in a bit. But when I saw them, I wanted to go and see his old records. So I took out his pan from 15 years ago. This is a pan from when he was 11. Let's look at the canines. Here the canine isn't overlapping. Here it is overlapping. So in hindsight, I mean, I didn't see him at age 11, but in hindsight, if the canine is overlapping the lateral, I would take out the canine. So this was never done. And let's look at him now. The canine has just decided not to come in. They're almost horizontal now. The primary canines are still in. So uh, now it's a, it's, a, it's a very difficult case. He has two canines, two palatal impacted canines. So uh, extracting the C's might, I, I can't guarantee that it would have helped, but I'm, it probably would have, maybe, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, last is orthodontic management. So orthodontic management, I'm gonna talk about labial impactions, palatal impactions, and finally extractions. Labial impactions are our best friends. We like labial impactions, they're easy to treat. Patients uh, love how uh, the results turn out. So the main concern with labial impactions is to bring the tooth in attached gingiva. Uh, this is based on the level of the canine, how high the canine is relative to the mucogingival junction. So if the canine is mostly below the mucogingival junction, you can just do a gingivectomy. So uh, I sometimes do these myself because you see the canine, I mean, you can feel it. You just use a blade, open a small window, the canine will come down. Uh, if it's mostly above the mucogingival junction, then you need an apically positioned flap because you want to make sure the canine comes down with attached gingiva. And finally, if the canine is really high, then you, leave, you need closed eruption. So you want to expose it, close it, and bring it down. Next, uh, so like I said, the most important is bringing the canine in attached gingiva. However, opening space is very important. Sometimes when you open space, you don't need to expose. So in this patient, this canine was, this canine was impacted. This patient, I think, if I remember correctly, was 19 years old. The six was extracted, it was uh, hopeless. So as you can see here with the progress, no exposure, nothing, just by pulling the six back, the, the five and four back, the canine has improved a lot. So the overlap went from total overlap to halfway overlap. The angle went from over 30 degrees to between 15 and 30. And the apex went from above the five to above the four. So the prognosis is much better now. 
without exposure. Another case uh, showing how opening space in labial impactions is very helpful. Here it's overlapping the lateral and even the central here. The angle is bad. Again, this I'm not presenting on sixes, but I have a lot of first molar extraction cases. Uh, this is a topic for another day, but here we had to extract the six. As you can see here, retracting the four and the five, the angle improved a lot. The overlap went from full to halfway. The angle improved from the over 30 degrees to almost less than 15. And the apex also, it was above the four. Now the apex is in the proper position. The opening space is very important before attempting to expose, in my opinion. A lot of the time, they just come down on their own. You don't need to, to surgically expose. And the problem with high canines is they're high. So with labial impacted canines. So if you just put a wire, just biomechanically, the, want, the canine wants to come down, the adjacent teeth will want to go up. So if you just put a continuous wire, you'll get this, a high canine. If you don't think, you don't try and add anything, you'll have an open bite. So if you see here, there's an open bite, shallow bite anteriorly, and open bite on both sides. So that's why we use auxiliaries to help in terms of uh, bringing the canine down. You can either use a coil, either use a coil spring to move these, uh, the primo and the lateral away, uh, this way they don't tend to come up. Uh, use two wires, a base wire and another wire. Use elastics to bring the canine down or use a cantilever. Next, we're gonna talk about palatal impactions. We do not like palatal impactions. So palatal impactions are, are the cases, I mean, next to first molar extractions on the lower, you can't, I usually don't tell the patient the treatment is gonna be less than two to three years. So again, it's a long treatment time. Based, it depends based on the prognosis of the tooth. It takes two to four years depending on the difficulty. The steps is one to create adequate space. Create adequate space, the, the function, the, so the reason we created uh, adequate space for labial impractions is for the canine to come down on its own. Here we're not expecting the canine to come down. We just wanna create space so we're ready when we start pulling it out. So the next step is to surgically expose the canine. And I use a gold chain, there are other methods, but I just, uh, when the surgeon exposes it, I want him or her to bond a gold chain. And then we start pulling the tooth, orthodontic traction. So open space, expose, and move. Uh, and the canine is a big tooth, so, and it's within the bone. So this is a case, the, this 19-year-old uh, didn't have anything except for an impacted canine. Everything looked perfect. So I didn't want to mess his occlusion up. So uh, we exposed it. It's very close to the lateral. So the first step to me was I want to pull it distally. So I don't, and I want to keep everything as is. So I bonded this TP, banded or cemented this TPA and uh, bonded it to the five, seven, five, seven. So I'm almost pulling the canine against six teeth. And even with that, everything moved forward. So if you see on the right side, this, this side was class one, now it's class two while pulling the canine back. Uh, it's an easy fix. We just, I mean, now I need to bond everything, but I, I just put, I give the patient class two elastics. But I, this just uh, demonstrates how big and how hard it is to move the canine. So this is the same case that I just showed you in steps. So we bonded the, the appliance, exposed, started pulling the canine distally more. And then once we're fine, we start pulling it labially. Once we're out, we start torquing it with a heavy wire, and it's done. This took two years. And these are other uh, things we can use to uh, bring the canine down. So a Kilroy spring, two wires, same as, we, uh, same as I just showed in the labial impaction, a mouse trap, the Lista spring, or a cantilever. And finally, there are cases, of course, where we have to extract the canine. Everyone's sad, but, but it might be the best option. So when do we extract? These are the two main reasons. If there's an unfavorable position for the canine, a completely horizontal impacted canine, or the patient just refuses to go through treatment just because of the length of the treatment. I don't wanna go through two, three years of treatment. I wanna finish in a year. So of course we give the patient the option. We tell them the canine might be the better option, but if he refuses, we can't do anything. We have to extract it. If the canine is affected anatomically, it might be dilacerated, uh, we might consider extracting it. Severe crowding, you're extracting a tooth anyways, premolar maybe, 
and then the canine has poor prognosis, it might be better to just extract the canine, and if the C has an acceptable appearance. So after, if you decide to extract the canine, you need to manage the space. So these are what you need to do. You either protract the premolars. So you have to move the premolars forward and substitute that canine with the premolar or put the premolar in the canine space. Implant, autotransplantation, and finally, if the C is kept in its place, you have to inform the patient that the C might eventually be lost. So uh, uh, this, so let's say you decide to extract the canine. The C has uh, a nice appearance. So you want to retain the deciduous canine. That is a valid option. Why? Because the canine, the, the, roots of, the roots of the deciduous teeth usually resorb as the permanent teeth corrupts. In case of a very poor prognosis or if you decide to extract the canine, the roots of the canines, the primary canines, will be intact. So I usually try and finish my presentations with a nice case as a wow factor, but unfortunately here I, I really want to finish with this paper. It's a very important paper. This group uh, assessed root resorption in retained C's, D's, and E's in patients with severe hypodontia. They had PANS and pa these patients from zero to 40. Uh, they had no, uh, they had hypodontia with no permanent successors for these, for the C, D, and E. They had 356 patients. And if we look here, let's just focus on the C's because this is what we're looking at, the E's and D's. I mean, it's a nice paper. If you haven't uh, read it, it's a nice read. So let's look at the canine. The lower canine, lower primary canine has better prognosis than the upper. In 70% of the cases, there is little or no resorption up to the age of 40. So up to the age of 40, there's almost no resorption in the primary canine and it can stay in its place. In the upper, it's slightly less, it's almost 60% with little or no resorption. Uh, almost 10 and almost 15% here of these Cs will have resorption above 75%, which um, warrant extraction. So 60 to 70% of these canines will stay. But again, always uh, protect your back, inform the patient that these Cs might eventually be lost. So no one can whistle a symphony. It takes an orchestra to, to play it. And uh, meetings like this, uh, like the Saudi Pediatric Society uh, and other orthodontic societies bring us together. So coming together is the beginning. Keeping together is progress. And finally, working together is success. So this brings me back to the title of, uh, of this webinar, which is working together is success. We need to make sure we can work together, work well together, and throw our egos out the window. Thank you, and I'll take any questions if you guys have any. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for your uh, informative uh, lecture. And uh, uh, we'll start with the uh, questions. First, uh, first questions. Uh, the audience asking, uh, they say, uh, they thank you for your uh, nice presentation. And she, they said, he said that in, uh, when you put uh, two by four in, in the case, uh, there is lower lingual arch and all the permanent teeth are erupted. Do you think there is need for uh, it? She means the lower lingual arch. It, it depends on the case. If, if, if I feel the lower canine is, is, I mean, if I have enough space, for the permanent canine to come in, and if it's erupting properly, I don't always put a lower lingual arch. If the canine on the bottom is also ectopic, which might be the case with an ectopic uh, upper canine, then I'll put in a uh, lower lingual holding arch to make sure I, I fix both canines. Yeah. Okay. Another uh, question is, what is the routine radiographs you use in your clinical practice for uh, diagnosis such displacement? So uh, the pan is the first thing I take. I, so I, I, I know others take CBCTs on everyone. If I know there is a canine impacting before I see the case, sometimes I'll just go ahead with the CBCT. Like if, if the patient comes in and he, he or she has seen someone else, I'll just take a CBCT because from the CBCT, can, I can extract a pan, a seth and everything. But if it's my patient, the first time I see the patient, I'll, the first thing I'll take is the pan. If I need further investigation, then I'll take a CBCT. Okay, clear. Another question is, uh, if you have a case of impacted canine that is causing external root resorption, 
of lateral incisor? What treatment options you, you have? First thing I do is I cringe because I don't like seeing those. Uh, it depends on how much resorption there is. If, uh, I mean, even if, if I've, I've had cases where the resorption, the root length of the crown was one to one and it stayed in nicely. So the first thing I'll do is evaluate the case. If I don't have any crowding, if I have crowding and I'm taking out the teeth anyways, I will consider taking out that lateral incisor. If the case doesn't warrant extraction, like in general, it's not an extraction case. I'll try to move the, the, the canine distally and evaluate the lateral incisor as I go. If it's still one-to-one -one or better than one-to-one, -one, I'll keep it. Yeah, uh, another question. Is, um, do you think the auto-transplantation of canine is a treatment option? I, have, I haven't had any cases of auto-transplantation. Uh, it is an option, but uh, I know it comes with complications. It can get ankylosed. It, it's, it requires one or two surgical procedures. It's, it's not easy, but it, it is always an option. Uh, I, I don't have any cases, though. There is uh, another question, the same. So that, uh, that means it's hot topic. They need uh, <laughs> clear answer. I shouldn't have mentioned it. <laughs> OK. Uh, when you should close the diastema uh, with uh, two by four, if you uh, fear that uh, the canine will be impacted. So, I mean, in uh, case of ugly yeah. duckling stage, I think. Yeah, so if, if, only if I feel the canine is ectopic. So, so if the canine, that's why I don't go in unless the canine looks like it's overlapping the lateral or if there's completely no space. If there is space, I have a diastema, I'll just take a pan and monitor the patient. I'll take another pan in a year and see how the patient uh, has evolved. If there is completely no space for the canine, then I'll, I'll put a coil and close the diastema and use the diastema space to help the canine to erupt, in, uh, erupt properly. Okay, yeah. When the patient requires an exposed bone, uh, usually we, we write uh, content to, to write some consequences and such as failure of bonding, tooth may not move, and what are the risks you usually encounter with A and B with a golden chain, for example, in, in your case, the previous case with mm -hmm. the golden chain traction? So luckily, the case I showed, uh, the, the, the gold chain stayed on for the two years. But you do have cases where the gold chain, of course, debonds. It, if that, uh, although to my surgeons, I always tell them, put as much composite as you want. I, I want that chain to stay on there. I want to remove the chain myself. Uh, the other thing I have a case I'm doing now, and, and it's, it's not running as smooth as the one I showed, we expose the, the canine now three times. Every time we expose, and the chain is still on there, but every time we move the, the tooth, it's still like it, it, the, the gingiva overgrows and we can't move the tooth. So if you're talking about complications I get is gingival overgrowth. Uh, as you move the tooth, sometimes the tooth falls into the gum. But I've haven't, I haven't had uh, debonds in terms of gold chain. But, but of course, I'll, uh, in terms of consent, I'll always tell the patient, treatment won't take less than two years, expect two to four years. Uh, expect you might have some attachment loss, you might have some recession on the canine as we bring it in. I'll move, uh, I'll use low forces, but there is still a chance that, that we will have attachment loss. And they will accept uh, another uh, surgery and to, to attach the, the chain? This, this patient was nice. So I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate if, I know some patients will just blame it all on you and tell you, you didn't do your job. This patient was very, she was educated, she, she was aware of the whole situation, and she saw that we were pulling the canine, and every time the canine comes down, it goes up again. So she understood, and she, she even said, I, 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 I want to have another surgery. Good. Another okay. question is, uh, how often you review the maxillary canine traction? I mean, he, he asking about Oh, in terms of follow-up visits? Yeah, yeah. If, if, if I'm using power thread or gold chain, I see the patient every three to four weeks. But if I'm using a cantilever, because a cantilever has a long uh, range of action. So you can leave a cantilever in for six, seven weeks and the canine will just move. Or even when you, knew, you we use two wires, the night eye is active for, for a long time. But I still always see them in, in four weeks. Other questions. Studies show that labial displacement are more common in Asian population. Do you think the same apply in Saudi Arabia? 
Hmm. I, Did you study in this field? I am not aware, but I feel in terms of, of labial infections, a lot of them can be overdiagnosed. Like sometimes it's just, it's crowded and you just open space and the canine comes down. Some will diagnose this as a labial infection. To me, it's not always a labial infection. Sometimes it's just a tooth that needs space. But I'm not aware, I'm sure there is, but I am uh, personally not aware of ones, uh, of a study that shows the prevalence here. Uh, there is another question, it's not totally related, but I will mention it if you have answer. What would be the management of that dilacerated root? I, I think it's, uh, um, is related to the canine. If the canine is dilacerated and not erupted, what is the management? What is your management in this case? So the well, first thing is I'll tell the patient it might take more than two to four years. It might take, if I'm bringing the canine down, I'll tell them three to five years. Because <laughs> you have several options. If bringing the canine is the right treatment option, then I'll try to bring it in. But most of these cases, as the canine comes down, the dilaceration disappears. So as you're bringing the canine in, a lot of the dilac tooth with dilacerated tips, the tip resorbs. And sometimes it doesn't resorb, it comes down. If it's a huge dilaceration, I have to show this with my finger. If it's a huge dilaceration, it might even push against the lateral. So if, if it's a huge dilaceration, it doesn't resorb, you might have to finish the canine in, in an angle so that the tip isn't touching the adjacent tooth. And the uh, complete removal is not an option? It, it, like, if, if, if extraction is the right option, again, I will propose it. But if the patient doesn't have crowding, uh, the uh, patient has enough space, the face can't afford extraction, then I'll try to bring the canine in. If it doesn't move, of course, yeah, but uh, you'll tell the patient that there is a chance of extraction. So if the canine just doesn't move, you have to go back and reevaluate. Uh, another question for the case of uh, two by four. Uh, by using two by four to close the space, do you expect the lateral to move against canine, which will increase the possibility of its resorption. Very important, very nice biomechanic question. So because of course, as you push the lateral incisor toward the central, the crown moves mesial, the root moves distal. In a lot of those cases, I tilt the bracket. So before I start, I, I push the root of the lateral mesial. So I'm pushing it away from the canine. So while I push the lateral, I'm pushing the whole tooth bodily. I don't want the root to go distally as the question, my good question. Yeah. What do you think of case with one labial and other palatal displaced canine? Uh, that's, I've, I haven't seen any, but that's, uh, you have to have two brains because every, every <laughs> canine will have different treatment methods. So uh, it's an interesting case, but I haven't, I haven't had any. Dr. Ahmed, uh, thank you very much for your uh, uh, yes. presentation, for your discussion. We enjoy it and uh, I'd like to uh, appreciate your time and effort. Thank Dr. you Manal, very much for having me. Thank you. Dr. Manal, are you with us? Um, yes. Uh, Mike, with you. Yeah. Um, thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you, Dr. Ali, mm -hmm. for moderating the session with me. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for the very nice presentation. Um, uh, it's a pleasure in, uh, to present this uh, certificate uh, of appreciation in the name of Saudi Dental Society for Dr. Anas Salmi for being with us today and also for Dr. Ahmed Masoud for your uh, great participation and hope we will see you again in other, uh, uh, probably other uh, symposiums or uh, conferences here in Jeddah. Um, and also, we would like to thank our moderator, Dr. Ali Zahrani, uh, my colleague and dear friend. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ali, for being with us today. And uh, I'd like to um, come uh, with two nice uh, presentations. Uh, so, hope to see you next week. Uh, same time at eight o'clock. And um, if you have any questions, we will be having the emails of Dr. Masoud and Dr. Anas uh, in our uh, website. And uh, so you can ask them any further question that you need. Uh, thank you for being uh, with us, all our audience.
and um, hope to see you again next week. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure, Dr. Anas and Dr. Ahmed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Shukran, yaatikum al afiya. We shall we'll meet soon again, inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.